Uh, let's move on to something else that happened at PMQs today. It's, uh, it's meant this. It's meant that it's official. It's sort of over. Is it sort of over? Boris Johnson announced plans to drop all remaining COVID restrictions from the end of this month. All legal requirements to self-isolate will be removed uh, four weeks sooner than had been anticipated. Does this mean life will go back to normal, uh, it rather depends. The relaxation applies to England. It's worth stating that uh, from the get-go. It's unclear whether Nicola Sturgeon uh, will follow suit, uh, nor whether other politicians and business leaders who've been reluctant to accept that Omicron is on the way out will now drop their insistence on things like continued mask wearing. But for many, today's announcement brings the curtain down on two years of life being micromanaged by the state in a way that's not been seen outside of wartime. Well, Cathy Gingell, as I say, is alongside me and writes a lot about COVID. We're not going to get into some aspects of it. I want to keep this narrowly focused on this idea of how easy it will be for anyone, Prime Minister, anybody else to say, that's it, guys. You, we, we've all done our penance. It's been a long two years. Let's get back to normal. Well, I'm not sure it is over. I will only know it's over when they stop mass testing. There's no more testing of school children. There's no, absolutely no more mask wearing by children in schools. There's no more of what I actually thought was very abusive to children, and, and I'm not alone in that. Robert Halfon and other people have been very concerned about the mental impact on children. So, first of all, I'm not sure it is over. I will want to hear that Test and Trace is being disbanded and that no more money is being spent on this highly invasive um, programme and that they're going to look actually at the value of those tests. I mean, if they're not, not used to... Then, yes, you really have such a strong point. The country's been so... You probably won't agree with me, but what I call indoctrinated, interfere about... I think I do, Cathy, actually. But, yeah. um, and I think, actually, how you lift... You know, some people have called it mass formation, a, a major... I mean, Lord Sumption wa wa warned about it at the beginning, a form of hysteria, which the government really jumped onto the bandwagon of. Now they've done this to the population. People are genuinely scared still. Actually, in my view of something, they really probably... It's a little bit irrational and out of proportion. But... I'm not sure how you bring people out of that. You set examples in schools. You do set examples by no more mask wearing. After all, most people catching COVID in hospitals. So did the masks, you obviously have to have medical masks, but did the masks in hospitals help? Well, well, you know, well, there, well, there, well all you, these well, curious well, questions. And I, you know, and I, and I don't want to freight this with, with unnecessary emotion, mm -hmm. but some people will be watching what we're saying or listening to what we're saying, mm. and they'll say, well, hang on, Cathy. 150,000 dead Brits, 5.5 5 and a half yeah. million dead from COVID, with COVID sometimes, yeah. not necessarily of COVID, across the world. Had we not taken the steps that the state oh. took in this country, well, you don't know, I don't know, well, nobody knows how we, high the death well, toll would we, be. We certainly know now from the major report that was published two or three days ago, a bit bored, that the lockdown actually made no difference on deaths. So we know now what a lot of us have really feared, that we had this tremendous disruption socially and economically, possibly to make no difference to the number of deaths. Uh, can, can I just... One final thought before we move on to another story that's, that's been moving along today. I, I still struggle with this idea. You mentioned Sage earlier. Uh, some modellers have got it broadly right, some modellers got mm. it really wrong. And there were consequences to that, mm. as you say. If you had a model that was massively pessimistic, mm. led to massive lockdown, yeah. and that had all these resulting mm. unexpected loss of life from cancer mm. or whatever else it was, mental health, mm. even things like stalking mm. increased, oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, abuse, certainly. But, but here's my point, and it's, and it's a slightly philosophical mm. point you headed one, but I think it's an important one. How do you introduce an element of moral hazard for modelling. If somebody gets it wrong, it's not their fault yes. that they've produced a model which yeah. other people then act on, but what, do you keep asking the same models well, again and again? To, to, well, to I don't think you... The, one of the problems, they did keep on asking the same models again and again, and if you look at the makeup of SAGE and the commissioning of the modelling service, they were commissioning themselves and their own universities to do, to do the modelling programmes that then came back with the answers that they wanted then to advise the government. So the government... One of my major criticisms would be the government did not look broadly enough and include a big enough range of scientific advice. And it really was limited to a rather predictable group of people coming to their predictable conclusions.
Okay, Cathy for now, thanks very much indeed.